Once again, good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, uh, we have, a, as usual, a number of updates uh, that we'll try to go through relatively quickly. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Kevin Shulman uh, giving a, a good talk today about uh, COVID-19 and economics. Um, I want to just make the usual announcement that I usually do. Uh, this, as all grand rounds and past grand rounds have CME available, I will send an email uh, via, uh, I send a message via the chat function to um, uh, link you to that. We'll send the emails out after this as well with the usual links to CME. Uh, today, we're going to do something a little bit different, a little bit of experiment. Uh, and in order to try to answer some more of your questions, because we, as you know, we always have a ton of questions that aren't answered. I'm going to ask the panelists to try to answer all the questions as we go throughout the hour and via typing. So they're going to answer the questions uh, in the Q&A function, and then you all can see that live. At the end, hopefully by the end of the day, thanks to Jack, uh, and Zhang, and An Lee, who's been helping us with a lot of the website stuff, they're going to take all those questions and answers and put them on a website. It's going to be behind a, a I'll probably put it behind a student block wall, uh, but you can access all those. So we'll send a link to that at the end of the day as well. So if you don't have time to read the answers today, you can see it later in the day. And feel free to give us feedback on how that works. We're hoping that one, we get to answer more of your questions. Two, I use, uh, get better use of all the panelists who are joining us today and every week. And then three, uh, I imagine there'll be a lot of questions for Kevin. And so my goal is to try to get to uh, some of your questions or many of your questions you might have for Kevin when he's done with his presentation. So that being said, we'll move on to our weekly updates. Dr. Harrington, anything else to add before we start with our updates? No, I just want to thank you, Errol, for, uh, for keeping this going. Thank our panelists for taking time every week to doing it. And thank my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Kevin Schulman, who's really uniquely positioned to talk to us about these issues as a professor of medicine in the School of Medicine and a professor of economics in the Graduate School of Business. So it should be a really terrific grand rounds. I'm glad that it remains of interest to uh, many people in the community. So with that, thanks to everybody for being here and I'll turn it back to you, Errol. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Bob. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing on the first screen here. Okay, great. And then we'll start off with uh, Dr. Risk uh, talking with updates this week. Okay, so Errol, could you put my slides up? <clears throat> I'm just going to say a few brief words about where we are now in the, the um, evolution of this pandemic. It's the next slide. <clears throat> um, this is from this morning from Santa Clara County. Uh, you can see in the cumulative cases by specimen collection date that the <clears throat> number of um, cases is flattening. Um, and if you look below there on the new cases by specimen collection date, you'll see that they seem to be somewhat falling. This may be an artifact of um, less testing, which is clearly happening right now in Santa Clara County. <clears throat> we had 27 new cases, we had 88 deaths, there were five new deaths. Um, and uh, as we've said before, uh, the cumulative cases by age group tend to be middle-aged, but the deaths are actually uh, continue to be in the older age group. If you just saw the next slide. <clears throat> so a lot of detail on this slide, but this is the hospital data. And what it shows is that there's 175 patients in Santa Clara County who are hospitalized. The number in the ICU is currently 80, and it's run from about 74 to 82 over the last um, week or so. So it's not changing much. It's falling just a little bit. The ventilators in use has fallen from about 194 to 174. <clears throat> and the bottom panel on the right shows we have uh, in that light brown area, tons of capacity for surge <clears throat> which we're really not using. And, um, excuse me, <clears throat> half of the deaths in California are actually in Southern California. California ranks 30th if you normalize it for population in deaths per 100,000. Um, and so uh, the most of the activity and the growth in COVID uh, in California is far south of us. And we've really sort of leveled off to slightly declining, but not rapidly declining. Next slide. <clears throat> if you just think about 
how what we are doing at Stanford Hospital, we have 14 COVID patients in the hospital right now, four in the ICU. We haven't intubated anybody actually in about three weeks. So on the very severe end of the spectrum, uh, not much new. One of the things we're talking about now is getting back to work. Uh, certain conditions for reopening have been established by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and also by Governor Newsom. And I'm just going to run through those very quickly um, <clears throat> so that we can see where we are to think about getting back to work in a few weeks. Uh, so the criteria for getting back to work are include adequate testing of healthcare workers and patients. So on that front, we've tested about 4,000 healthcare workers. <clears throat> there are 2.6% positive in the symptomatic group who had an influenza-like illness. <clears throat> and we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're just getting information about the asymptomatic group and only about 0.4% so far are in our asymptomatic healthcare workers are infected. So this seems very, very low. In the last two days, thanks to Song Chang and Andre Bloomcombs and lots of other people, we've tested over 2,000 healthcare workers. And Song's going to talk more about that in a minute. <clears throat> Soon we will be testing all inpatients and the higher risk pre op outpatients. So we're in pretty good shape on the testing front. Ability to accommodate a surge. This morning we had 52 empty ICU beds and 176 empty uh, ward beds. So again, we meet that criteria. Uh, another criteria that was set out by Governor Newsom was identifying potential therapies. There are about 70 COVID studies at Stanford going on right now, controlled trials and epidemiologic work, but also therapy work. So we're, we are, I think, living up to our obligations and well surpassing them there. Declining cases was another criteria. I would say that it's leveling off and it's slightly declining, but not majorly declining yet in Santa Clara County. And that's probably the biggest impediment. Um, and then the two other ones are not really medical center uh, specific, ability to provide social distancing in businesses and schools and care for the elderly. We are helping test four hotspots in um, uh, SNFs in uh, skilled nursing facilities in Santa Clara County. So I think we are getting really ready to be able to think seriously about how we should reopen and in what tiered fashion and their committees working on that. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Norm, for those updates. We'll next move over, move over to Dr. Megan Mahoney. Oh, thank you, Errol. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to provide some quick updates on the ambulatory care COVID response. And um, first, I'll just update everyone. I received information from Maya Artandi that the Crown Clinic, again, this is the clinic that is dedicated to providing care to COVID positive patients um, and then patients who are at risk for COVID. Uh, so here's some information. It opened last week on the first floor of Hoover. Uh, they'll be providing proactive outreach of known COVID patients for 14 to 21 days from the date of symptom onset for all respiratory and non-respiratory concerns. Um, so uh, the, uh, the big question is, how do I refer my patient? Well, it's good to hear that they're actually going to be tracking all of the positive uh, tests. Uh, from the Stanford lab and automatically identify them and then reach out to them. Uh, so a referral would not necessarily be necessary. However, if you're interested, I'll uh, put in the Q&A their phone number to call. Uh, they'll be making an assessment of medical and social needs, and that's been going on uh, since the beginning of the epidemic. Um, here are their hours, and then it was great to hear from Dr. Risk about all of the research studies that are happening. Many of them are happening in the outpatient space, and they're happening um, actually at this, at this clinic. Uh, so, um, so we're very excited about that. And then the other um, part that I wanted to present was there were a lot of questions about community testing and our partnerships that are active. And you can see the various activity across the Bay Area that the Stanford Lab is participating in. One, um, the Stanford Lab can uh, serve as a reference lab for various facilities that are listed here and um, patients in um, other target populations are being outreached to and invited into our drive-through platform as well. 
So you can see that we are preparing for that testing capacity during a reopening phase. And, um, and then these are the, the priority populations that are being tested. So medically high-risk patients, first responders, essential service workers, healthcare workers, homeless populations, and then skilled nursing facility and assisted living facilities, which we'll hear more about from Dr. Um, Marina Martin a little bit later. And then just to, um, to end this uh, part of um, the update, just by saying that I think, um, you know, we've heard about Gavin Newsom's uh, framework and all the different components and conditions for reopening. We also heard from the White House about, you know, guidelines on um, the different phases of reopening. Um, but I was encouraged um, when I heard uh, Governor Newsom talk about we're entering into a phase of optimism as well. And Arudati Roy recently um, published a piece about this area being a portal into the future. Um, I've also heard people talk about it's a time machine into the future. So I'm encouraged, this is a very exciting time for us to rethink how we are practicing medicine, uh, how to design and maybe re-engineer the care delivery in the ambulatory space, and there's a task force that's being convened to look at that. Um, how can we uh, think about transforming uh, ambulatory care at post-COVID that better serves the needs of, of us as providers and as patients? Thank you. You need volume, Errol. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Song, we'll move over to you next, uh, and I'll turn off sharing for just a moment. Good morning. Uh, in the occupational health arena, as Norm mentioned, uh, on Monday, we started voluntary uh, testing of asymptomatic employees uh, and faculty. Uh, and the purpose of this was to further increase the safety of our workplace uh, by identifying asymptomatic persons uh, who are PCR positive, but also to try to understand patterns of antibody positivity by work site and by job roles to improve uh, the safety of our workplace going forward. So uh, uh, the emergency room started at eight in the morning. We have a bunch of other sites, occupational health, uh, Hoover, Valley Care, and uh, later this week we'll be standing up Redwood City and South Bay Cancer Center uh, and uh, testing sites throughout uh, our health system. Uh, so far we have 2,600 who have been tested with both uh, nasal PCR and uh, serum antibody testing. That's almost a fifth of our workforce in a uh, little over two days. So it's, uh, uh, it's a testament, I think, to the interest of the community in, uh, in helping us further these purposes. We had 800 on Monday and then 1,500 yesterday, and so the numbers seem to uh, go up as much as uh, capacity we can create. Uh, the results, uh, Norm already shared, uh, the PCR positivity rate is around 0.4% with just uh, early numbers in, so pretty low. Uh, the IgG positivity uh, reflecting uh, past infection was 1.3%, uh, and the IgM positivity, uh, which reflects either much more recent infection or there's a high rate of cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses like the common cold, uh, that was 2.6%. Uh, so, uh, relatively low numbers uh, in all categories. Uh, I'd just like to encourage uh, everyone in the audience uh, who provides care or otherwise works at, uh, at SHC to consider getting tested. I think uh, we would really appreciate the contributions of the safety of the workplace. Great. Song, thanks so much for that. Uh, next, we have Dr. Marina Martin. Dr. Marina Martin is a, a thank you for joining us this morning. She's the section chief for geriatric medicine uh, for the primary care division, and she's going to provide some updates on nursing home involvement. So thanks for being with us this morning. Really important topic. Thanks for having me. Um, so I just wanted to give a little background um, because skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities are both really affected by this pandemic and are actually quite different. Um, both are usually owned by for-profit or not-for-profit companies, uh, but skilled nursing facilities have a medical model and they're overseen by the State Department of Public Health, while assisted living communities and board and care homes uh, are under the State Department of Social Services and are non-medical facilities. Stanford actually no longer owns any skilled nursing facility beds, but it does discharge two SNFs all over uh, our local counties and it admits as well from local skilled nursing facilities and assisted livings, uh, particularly the ones in the circle around Stanford, including the V, 
Sequoia's Portola Valley, Palo Alto Subacute. Um, and all of these settings have been disproportionately hit by the COVID pandemic. At least one in five deaths nationwide and half of the deaths in Santa Clara County have been in long-term care facility residents. Um, and there's, people think this is likely undercounted uh, due to poor reporting for various reasons from these facilities. And in some tallies, they also don't include assisted living facilities. Um, and the reason these places are so vulnerable um, in many ways is they have the perfect combination of factors to spread coronavirus, including the most vulnerable patients, um, congregate living, and typically there's uh, one nurse to 20 to 30 patients in a skilled nursing facility, so it's very easy to pass from person to person to person. Uh, the patients many times have cognitive impairment and they can't follow infection prevention strategies like wearing a mask or staying put. Um, in many facilities, there's a dire lack of PPE um, using no masks or cloth masks or plastic bags for gowns or things like that. Um, and then there's poor education and training in general. And these really conspire to make these facilities the perfect place to spread the virus. Uh, next slide, please, Errol. So my geriatrics colleagues nationally and the CDC and CMS really agree that there are four best practices or areas where the, to really help prevent and control the pandemic in facilities. Um, and these probably look very familiar to us in hospital settings as well. Um, but unfortunately, the public health system has not really been able to meet these needs in facilities at this time. There are so many of them um, in San Mateo County alone. Um, if you count all the small board and care homes that have six to 10 residents, six residents or so, um, all the way up to the largest, there are 430 facilities and San Mateo County is a much smaller county than Santa Clara, so it probably has thousands. Um, fortunately, Santa Clara County has actually uh, been ahead of the curve with a pretty coordinated effective response uh, in its facilities. So what's needed? Um, well, we need to collaborate. There needs to be collaboration with departments of public health in educating facilities in their best infection prevention strategies really helping them prevent introduction of the virus in the first place. And I'd like to give a shout out to my geriatrics faculty colleagues who've been working with me doing this education for San Mateo County facilities and to our Palo Alto Medical Foundation geriatrics colleagues who did infection prevention training in 15 SNFs in Santa Clara County. Um, sufficient PPE is a huge problem, unfortunately, both procedure masks for preventive use and then full PPE once infection is introduced. Uh, Stanford could consider working with our county's departments of public health to help with this effort, given our success in obtaining reliable sources and donations um, for these facilities. So I'm in conversation with folks about that as well. Um, and then, as Dr. Mahoney said, as we, um, as we speak, Stanford Healthcare is working with, with the counties to expand testing facilities. That's really been a struggle for them due to the volumes. Um, because the best practice is to test everyone in the infected facility, but that's been really hard to do to date. Um, and then staffing plans. So one of the challenges is that once a facility does get infected, 50 to 80 percent of the nursing staff may test positive or quit. Uh, and then suddenly there are very few people to care for the residents. So the public health departments are working with nursing schools and others locally to try and um, get people in to care for the residents. So in summary, these facilities are very highly vulnerable to the coronavirus. They act as accelerators uh, in this pandemic. And really the public health system is struggling to manage this. So hopefully um, to some degree we can help from Stanford. Thank you. Great, uh, Dr. Martin, thanks again so much. Uh, next we'll move on to Dr. Lisa Shea, uh, she's one of my fellow hospitalists. She's in charge of quality improvement and thanks for joining us this morning. Okay. Good morning, Errol. Um, I actually have two non-COVID specific announcements to start with. Um, I wanted to announce that we are having our sixth annual quality improvement and Pacific Symposium for our residents and fellows and students. It's going to be virtual on May 18th, and this will be a great opportunity for our trainees to showcase their fantastic QI work over the year. Um, we're, I want to thank Anne there, Tal Nelson and Bill for hosting the GME website where we'll post all the posters and abstracts. And we're going to have judging from our faculty and quality improvement entity leadership to be able to talk and uh, discuss with our trainees and we'll be giving out awards. So more to come. Uh, next slide, please. Errol? 
Oh. Yes. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? Um, also, I wanted to introduce a new program that we started. I'm oh, sorry, um, second, the second slide. A new program this year where we actually um, are trying to stimulate our frontline providers to think of ways to um, deliver high value innovation uh, care. So we have a challenge this year. We just, um, you see our first cycle winners, Josh and Brandon. We just announced our second cycle winners, Andrea and Ben. All these projects are then brought to the cost savings reinvestment program. And just this month, Ben and one of our hospitals, Nick Scolius, presented their work on the low um, reduction of low value serum magnesium testing, and it was well received in the program. So we're super excited about this, and we're starting our third cycle now, and uh, you can send me proposals. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to end with a really exciting ITDP Department of Medicine project where we are trying to um, investigate the use of artificial intel intelligence to help detect um, our clinically trained patients earlier. So you can imagine in the COVID um, pandemic, being able to do this and um, identify those patients who, are, who need for early innovation uh, would be really important so that we can actually innovate them in a careful control setting with proper PPE and safer for our patients and our healthcare workers. So we've been actually running the EPIC duration index silently on the background for months now. And now we're, um, I'm gonna call out Ron Lee and the IT team for validating this um, tool. They actually say that it works um, just as well in our COVID patients, so that's really good to hear. And then Margaret Smith has been um, having design workshops with our frontline providers, such as our critical care nurses and fellows, our MD primary teams, our nurses, and we're basically trying to design the best way to display this information to help our frontline providers take the best care of our patients. Um, this is really exciting too because it's a partnership with our Vascular Sciences Unit so we can study the impact of this um, intervention. So thank you, Errol. This is what I have. Lisa, excellent. And then we have next, uh, again, back with us, Dr. Ben Pinsky to talk about uh, updates on RT-PCR testing. Thanks, Errol. Um, this is just an update on the laboratory testing, uh, the molecular testing. Scott Boyd will talk about the antibody testing. Um, I just want to emphasize um, that we have built tremendous capacity in the clinical laboratory um, in a very rapid manner, and that has really allowed us um, to achieve the conditions for opening and is really the backbone of this uh, testing for healthcare workers that's ongoing. So. Um, I just want to give you a brief update here. So we have three active platforms. Um, we're running the Stanford Laboratory Developed Test, uh, which has received emergency use authorization from the FDA, as previously mentioned. Um, we're running also two commercial tests, the Hologic Panther Fusion, as well as the Cepheid Gene Expert. The Gene Expert I talked about last week is a rapid RT-PCR test um, with results between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, our current capacity, as I just said, is now quite high, uh, 2,800 tests per day. So the recent influx um, in testing from healthcare worker screening um, has not taxed us at all. So we're, we're humming along. Um, routine turnaround time is about 10 to 12 hours on average with almost all specimens being resulted within 24 hours. Um, I mentioned the stat turnaround time already. Um, we have performed over 20,000 RT-PCR tests. Um, and in addition, last week we, we began screening uh, blood products for the Stanford Blood Center. Uh, there is um, some evidence out of uh, China and Korea that uh, viral RNA can be detected um, in, in um, products collected from blood donors. Uh, there's not yet evidence for transfusion, transfusion transmitted infection. Um, but we want to be ahead of the curve here as we have been for all the laboratory testing um, and make sure that our blood supply is safe. Um, and then finally, uh, we evaluated the Abbott ID Now um, assay. This is uh, the supposed game changer. Uh, you saw our president plop it down on a, on a table during one of his speeches. Um, this demonstrated poor sensitivity in our hands about 80% um, compared to uh, the Panther Fusion instrument. 
Um, so we'd miss uh, one in five. So not good enough for our use here. Um, and this is now being widely reported in the media and uh, Abbott has walked back a number of their claims on test performance. So thank you, that's our update from uh, the, the uh, RT-PCR side of the lab. Ben, thank you so much. Uh, and then the last update, uh, Scott, Scott uh, Boyd's gonna talk about serology updates. Sure, yes. Um, so we've, uh, we've been testing all the samples that have been sent to the clinical lab. I think uh, as of yesterday, the numbers were 966 samples that have been tested with uh, 41 total samples that have been positive for IgG and 41 for IgM. That's a mixture of the inpatients as well as the new occupational health testing that's begun on a large scale. So I think some of the numbers that were said earlier about um, numbers that have been tested, um, that probably represents everything from you know testing ordered to blood being drawn to being somewhere on the way to the lab. But we expect we'll have a lot more data from the serology testing from that large bolus of new samples uh, soon. And the capacity for the lab uh, for doing the serology testing has gone up. We, we have a new instrument that increases our capacity by another 25% above what we had uh, had a week ago. So I think we should be able to deal with the influx of samples without uh, uh, any significant delays. Great. Scott, thanks so much for being with us as well every week. Uh, okay, great. So without further ado, we'll move on to our, our future presentation, which is Dr. Kevin Shulman. Dr. Kevin Shulman is a professor of medicine, associate chair of business development and strategy. And he's also, uh, I'm uh, honored to call a, a, a colleague as part of our division of hospital medicine, who's been ward attending with us this last month. And it's been really great to have him uh, be part of uh, helping with us. And he's a great clinician as well. He's gonna talk about COVID-19 and economics. So really excited to hear what he's gonna talk about. Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Errol, and uh, thanks for including me. Um, obviously, uh, this is a really challenging time, uh, you know, clinically. It's also an incredibly challenging time economically. People have been talking about the economics uh, of COVID to the U.S. economy, and I'm going to focus a little bit more specifically on what this might mean for healthcare. Um, so I want to just harken back to where we started from before COVID. Uh, you might remember that healthcare was a huge issue in the election. Uh, and one of the issues in the election was, uh, I, I like to show these slides. Uh, this is the median household income when people had jobs uh, for a family of four. And when you look at that income, you realize how challenging the economic issues are uh, for individual families. And so rhetorically in talks, I'll ask, how much money should these people out of this uh, amount of money uh, pay for health care? And usually people, non-healthcare folks would say three to 5% of their income. Healthcare folks would say maybe 10% of their income. And we all know this is actually what they're spending for healthcare. Uh, this is employer employee contributions for health insurance premiums. And this is an under, uh, under assessment of what they're spending on healthcare because obviously they're paying payroll taxes and federal and state income taxes to pay for Medicare and Medicaid on top of this. Um, and so we're entering, so we start with this huge challenge. Uh, healthcare spending, uh, this is Joe Dealman that we're working with at the University of Washington. Uh, healthcare spending increased 155% uh, from, uh, you know, 19, uh, from 2000 to 2017. Uh, and Joe's work suggests that about half of that increase was due to price increases uh, and increase in service intensity. Service intensity here being a hospital buying a practice. Uh, and then call it a hospital outpatient clinic. And so, um, uh, so about half of the reasons why health insurance premiums have gone up so much uh, are due to price increases in healthcare. This is Uwe Reinhardt from Princeton who passed away recently, a health economist who said, you know, it's the price is stupid. Uh, and uh, this is evidence for that. With some, uh, um, Healthcare spending can be catastrophic, and this is some work we did to look at spending uh, across deciles. Uh, each of these 10 deciles is 10% of healthcare spending. And for the highest cost deciles, the patients we're seeing in the hospital and the ICU, healthcare is catastrophic uh, in terms of the amount of spending, $183,000, $184,000 a person. Uh, but fortunately, it's a very small proportion of the population that's impacted, only 0.27% uh, of the population. Uh, the issue for the American public is that most of the people in the United States, fortunately, are in the lowest spending decile. Uh, and this analysis is MEPS data. It's a little bit under uh, representative of total spend. 
but for low cost, uh, the people, otherwise healthy people, which is 70% of the US population, uh, they're spending $6,000 per person in, in MEPS money for $711 of services. And even before COVID, they had to ask the question, why would I buy health insurance? What is the value of that to me? This is uh, last weekend's New York Times and a pretty uh, catchy headline. Um, and, and this is two uh, Nobel Prize winning economists uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, their take on where we're at right now is the American healthcare industry is not good at promoting health, but excels at taking money from all of us for its benefit. It's an engine of inequality. And I think we're gonna start to see more and more questions about why it is that the healthcare system wasn't prepared and wasn't uh, and is you know performing so poorly economically right now and i'll talk more about that the way we've been working and this is no secret to anybody uh this is uh, analysis arnie milstein and i did about medicare for all earlier this year uh, or i guess last year and one one of the things we looked at is what would happen if we all had to live on medicare payment rates uh so if bernie had uh, gotten further uh, and this analysis uses American Heart Association data that shows basically our, our business model is pretty simple. Uh, our cost, and this is average hospital costs across the country, are higher than what the public is willing to pay, both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but we're able to pass those, uh, we're able to get higher prices uh, from private health insurance uh, to balance our budgets. Um, and so as a result, if uh, private payments became Medicare payments, obviously we'd have a huge challenge. Um, but I'm also gonna talk about what would happen if private payments went away. I love showing this slide and it's, it's really pretty striking. This is uh, Kerway from uh, University of North Carolina published a couple of years ago. Um, and, and this looks at the patterns of care in the United States in 1996 compared to patterns of care in 2012, almost two decades later. And what you see is the patterns of care in healthcare did not change at all. Despite all of the innovation that we talk about, you know, the rates of visits, the rates of in-person visits uh, look the same over two decades. Uh, and obviously this kind of stagnation in, in a dynamic economy leads to higher and higher costs, which is what we've uh, been observing. So with all of that, we now face uh, this uh, horrible epidemic of coronavirus uh, that's impacting a couple our business in terms of how we provide care to patients, but it's also impacting our patients and the financing of healthcare. Uh, this is uh, the New York Times from, from last week, and obviously uh, uh, COVID has uh, been unbelievably catastrophic in terms of the broader economy. Uh, so 22 million people uh, lost their jobs. Uh, it goes without saying that these are potentially people who were commercial paid patients uh, who lost their jobs. So uh, go back a couple of slides and remember this is the proportion of the population uh, that, uh, that uh, drives our economic engine at Stanford. Uh, there was a lot of talk about whether or not these people could join uh, the uh, Obamacare health insurance exchange or uh, go to Medicaid. Uh, if you go back to those slides that I just showed you, that would be great. That would mean we wouldn't get, uh, they would have insurance coverage, but we'd move someone from a private pay patient to a public pay patient, and we'd have a hard time economically even with that. In terms of the impacts, we've seen uh, huge impacts on retail and huge impacts on small business. Uh, so thousands of stores have shut, potentially permanently. The New York Times today is talking about whether or not department stores would ever come back. Uh, Neiman Marcus may declare bankruptcy this week. Uh, we see small business and gig workers uh, really uh, suffering tremendous economic pain. Uh, and then people obviously not paying the rent. Um, as you think about that, this is uh, some data from last month on the economic impacts in California. Uh, obviously, we're still in April, uh, so we don't know what this looks like now, but we see huge changes in things like leisure and hospitality industries, construction industries, and other service industries. Um, the, again, these are um, proportions of patients who, by and large, had uh, commercial health insurance uh, before, uh, before COVID. 
there's a lot of talk about small business. We just passed a new bailout business yet again uh, for small business. We went through a $250 billion bailout uh, in a very short period of time. There's ideas that this new bailout, which $300 billion, we're also going to blow through very quickly. Part of this is to get employers to keep people on the payroll. Um, but uh, what uh, this uh, graphic from the New York Times is uh, the likelihood of staying in business depending on the pandemic duration um, of small businesses. Uh, and what you see is restaurants and bars by three or six months, uh, you know, the probability of them staying in business, they report is very low. Other retails, uh, again, really catastrophic uh, rates of uh, closures. So then, you know, this morning on NPR, they were talking about small business you know, in, especially in the Bay Area, having to pay rents, 41% of small businesses in California have laid off uh, their workers, some or all of their workers. Now, why is small business, why am I spending so much time on small business? Because small business employs about half of the private workforce. Um, and so when we think about the commercial health insurance business, small business is a big chunk of that, uh, that market. Uh, and if these people can't pay workers, obviously they lay people off, they're not paying um, uh, for health care. Uh, but Blue Cross, uh, uh, Blue Shield in Northern California, I was talking with them, uh, they're not sure that any of these businesses are going to pay their health insurance premiums. Um, and so whether or not this is a short term or long term trend has a really important has huge implications for us at Stanford. Uh, here's another graphic from the New York Times about the economy. Again, this is through the beginning of April. Uh, and obviously, this is before uh, a lot of these restrictions went into place. And so this is going to potentially be even more catastrophic uh, by the end of this month. You know, people are arguing, is this short-term or long-term impacts on the economy? Will we be able to go right back to where we were? Or will we recover? And a lot of that depends on the scientific answers that we're all struggling with about how do we safely reopen the economy? How do we put in place ideas for our own workforce here at Stanford, but for other employers out there about getting the economic engines uh, back to business. In healthcare, um, in terms of short-term effects, uh, we're seeing this unusual uh, occurrence of layoffs. Uh, and uh, this is layoffs of people, basically a lot of high paying specialties that do a lot of elective procedures. Uh, where we're not uh, able to perform those procedures right now um, and, uh, and we can't redeploy those patients. Um, we're seeing uh, you know, small practices struggling, uh, especially practices in, in you know, um, again, these spe high paying specialty areas. Um, and so uh, what's gonna happen to those folks? How are we gonna balance uh, those of us, say, in hospital medicine uh, with uh, our colleagues in higher paid specialties, um, you know, we're maybe carrying the freight now, they were carrying the freight before. Um, and is this a time where we're going to have to really rethink um, the relationship between the kind of work we do uh, and the payment rates, especially if this becomes a longer term trend uh, with the changes in commercial health insurance? Um, without commercial and health insurance, a lot of these high paying specialties may not uh, be as attractive as they were previously. Uh, I gave some of these suggest comments to uh, the, the practice at Duke uh, last week as a, as a visiting professor. And I think this really is a, a kind of one reckoning about why do some of us do similar works of others and, and get different payment rates. Uh, outside the United States, obviously, the, the relationship between payment rates for specialty physicians uh, and, and non-specialty physicians are, are much closer than they are here. Uh, we've seen huge challenges with the supply chain. I've uh, actually uh, been looking at this. Uh, this struggles with supply chain. We're talking a lot about PPE right now, but the struggles with supply chain have been with us for a long time. This is a paper we wrote five years ago on failures in the generic drug market. Uh, and as a result of that work, there's an organization called Civica, which is a not-for-profit drug company that was set up at Intermountain Healthcare. Out of Intermountain Healthcare, about 250, uh, about 50% of the hospitals in the United States participate in Civica. And here's an email I just got, I'm on their advisory board last week, of all these sterile medications that were uh, going to be in short supply 
uh, Civica is now supplying uh, a, a big chunk of this to both the national stockpile uh, as well as to the participating institutions. Uh, and so this is an organization that said there's a problem with the supply chain. The supply chain is very focused on price and not quality. And this is quality of the products, but also reliability of the supply chain. You know, everybody in the supply chain in healthcare or no one was accountable. Uh, and we've now seen this. So Apple has a supply chain that spans the globe. Uh, but if Apple's not able to make iPhones, then Tim Cook's responsible. Um, in healthcare, if McKesson decides to source uh, products from a single supplier in India, they seem to not be responsible uh, for the fact that when we needed it, we don't uh, have it PPE. This is a, a graphic, a nice graphic from the New York Times during uh, uh, looking at Medicare for All. This is um, um, uh, Elizabeth Warren's health plan. Uh, but what it reminds us is that half of healthcare spending in the United States is coming from households and employers. Uh, and this would be true for Stanford, uh, you know, Stanford's uh, book of business. In fact, disproportionately our book of business is focused on households and employers. And so the question is what is happening in those markets? And there's not great statistics right now. Uh, I would say there's three concerns. One is premiums. Uh, are individuals uh, in the exchanges, they're heavily subsidized, but still are people gonna pay for health insurance premiums on this time? About a third of people with private health insurance have high deductible health plans, including some of us at Stanford, I have one. Um, people with high deductibles, or even if they have insurance, or do they have the money to pay the deductible to come in and see us? And then finally, do people have co-payments, even for relatively generous commercial insurance? Uh, do they have the out-of-pocket money available for co-payments? Uh, I got a great question when I did this uh, conversation at Duke last week, what can we do about that? People who have insurance but don't have co-payments. And frankly, I suggest that we give out, they give out, consider giving out coupons that for a three month period, we could actually say, we're gonna waive all, we're in this with you, we're gonna waive co-payments. Uh, please come in and see us. And I think we, here, even here at Stanford, we might wanna begin to think about how we're gonna be much more aggressive uh, about getting people with insurance to use their 80% insurance money uh, rather than their 20% co-insurance. We talked a couple of weeks ago in this uh, little piece with some of our fellows uh, about some of the longer term effects. I mean, is this the portent um, Megan talked about? Well, maybe this is optimistic. Maybe this is how we're gonna go forward, both in terms of digital technology, such as telemedicine or much more broadly. Uh, I talked here about using Amazon Alexa uh, in healthcare, uh, but, but making some of these changes permanent, also making some reimbursement changes, things like hospital at home, and th rethinking some of our policies that are so focused on bringing patients to the hospital, where we've now put ourselves and them at great risk. Uh, and so I think there's going to be a big debate about this. Unfortunately, on the back end of all of this, there's going to be a big push to actually go back to the ex ante, to go back to the world before video visits. We do 15,000 video visits a day now through 1,400 different providers at Stanford. Uh, and we're gonna get used to that. More importantly, the public is gonna get used to that. And so even if we wanted to bring everybody back to bricks and mortar visits, uh, we'll, we're gonna face a lot of resistance from our patients who can go to one medical or other providers that are moving much more quickly to the purely virtual world. And it's gonna be a huge challenge for us. The longest term effects are um, gonna be what happens with the US budget. And the things are changing at the federal level so quickly, federal and state level so quickly, there actually aren't great data. Uh, so before all of COVID um, uh, in March, the budget deficit for the US uh, reached $743 tr uh, billion. Uh, we were scheduled to go well over a trillion dollars. Um, now Moody's before the last $500 billion bailout bill suggests our deficit is going to be two and a half trillion dollars this year and two and a half trillion dollars next year. And they're talking about more spending. Uh, up in the pink on the right is our percentage, uh, is the federal debt as a percentage of GDP. And you see uh, these cat almost catastrophic projections uh, of where we're going. Now it's in the middle of an economic crisis. Uh, we need to spend this kind of money because otherwise the economy would totally seize up. Uh, the Federal Reserve had been talking last year about the tax cuts and its impact uh, on our capacity as a country. 
uh, to weather the storm, but what might happen on the other side of this uh, is a couple. One is what's gonna happen to interest payments um, on this debt. So at $24 trillion of debt, uh, interest payments if uh, at the height of the financial crisis, uh, interest rates went to 10% in Spain for government borrowing. Um, we're at 0% interest right now, but if interest rates went up, uh, our uh, payments, interest payments would also go up, which would put pressure on spending, either by the public sector or there's always a worry that it would crowd out private investment. The second issue is what's going to happen to the public health care programs, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, this deficit's occurring at uh, a big chunk of the spending of the federal government is Medicare and the federal portion of Medicaid. Uh, payments to hospitals, and maybe this will come back as uh, uh, another question on the back end of this. Can we afford to be as generous as we're being with seniors? Uh, Medicare uh, ran a $300 billion deficit last year, and obviously Medicaid's purely federal spending. There were a couple areas that were at risk uh, going into this election. Uh, Provider-based clinics, this is a report from the Office of the Inspector General a couple years ago at CMS, uh, basically saying that there was no justification for higher payment rates uh, for hospital outpatient facilities than for freestanding offices. Obviously, we've seen a freeze on that, but if you're looking to reduce Medicare spending, you might want to go back and look at this issue. Uh, for uh, uh, The idea of pay for value has been out there for a long time. If uh, you're running a hospital, you'd love to be in Michigan, which has 289 admissions per thousand Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, but if you're running a population health plan or a Medicare Advantage plan, you'd much rather be in Oregon with 185 admissions per thousand beneficiaries. Uh, we've seen a decline in the use of inpatient hospital services that we we all know about uh, over time. Uh, that's uh, been you know conflated by the uh, rise of the elderly population, about 5,000 people a day are joining Medicare right now, uh, but this long-term trend to reducing hospital use uh, is a really important uh, question for us. In terms of the economics, if you're a Medicare Advantage plan and you're getting paid to, re um, you, if you have an overhead of say 5% to do disease management and a lot of patient outreach, and you wanna break even uh, with that by reducing hospital utilization, in this quick and dirty analysis that we did, uh, your hospital utilization would have to come down about 12%. Uh, so again, moving from Michigan to Oregon as quickly as possible. Without, again, pre-COVID, one of the places we were most vulnerable to a change in the payment model is something called site of care optimization. That This is uh, uh, from Optum United Healthcare. Uh, and this is the idea of moving injectable infusion products out of the hospital environment altogether uh, and into uh, service infusion centers that they control. Uh, this is incredibly important to us because it, it's one of our biggest profit centers. Uh, Stanford is a uh, outpatient infusion. Disney in Orlando, Florida was building their own infusion centers for employees uh, to do infusions on things like TNF inhibitors. Um, so I think we're going to see an acceleration of this movement. Again, this is both an issue, a little bit of an issue in Medicare, much more of an issue, uh, Medicare and 340B, much more of an issue in the private health insurance market uh, that if they're looking to reduce premium uh, payment uh, costs, this is an area where they're going to go. And finally, again, looking at a longer term view, we've seen pretty significant changes on the payment side between health insurers and organizations called pharmacy benefit managers. Um, we continue to see a growth in the rebate models behind PBMs, rebates and chargebacks in 2019 with some new data we just got, uh, end up being 67% of, uh, uh, of the net uh, retained by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, huge amounts of money are flowing through this, and this is a huge distorting effect on how private health insurance and uh, uh, is going to respond uh, to the challenges of COVID. So Errol, uh, I know that was a, a lot very quickly, uh, but I know uh, we want to leave room for questions. So let me stop there uh, and uh, uh, see if there are questions. 
Kevin, thanks so much. Uh, this is really enlightening conversation and uh, a lot of stuff going on. It's really helpful for us to understand the economic side of things, which obviously affects the healthcare side of things tremendously. Um, thanks so much. And uh, I'm going through, I want to first thank all the panelists who've been going through and answering. We've answered uh, um, about 35 questions so far. That's way more questions than we usually get to in a given week. So thanks to the panelists for going through there and answering questions. I've been trying to dig through um, the remaining questions and also pick out ones that, uh, Kevin, that were also relevant to you. So I'm going to try to mix a little bit of both. Uh, Kevin, actually, one question to you here. Um, with my health insurance, I have a $75 copayment for my internal medicine primary care visits. Do you think other patients will put up that copay amount for a 12 minute video visit or telephone call? Um, yeah, so uh, they may or may not. I think uh, one of the questions is the design of that package. Uh, and then the other question is, are they gonna put it up for either one, whether to come see you in person or, or video? Um, you know, at least right now, a lot of people are waiving some of the copays for, for some of the telemedicine visits. Okay, great. Um, here's another one that just popped up. Put it here. Uh, aren't the trillion of dollars we are paying now the cost of not being prepared, i.e. relying on low cost foreign workers to produce medicines um, and equipment, uh, just in time delivery and reducing government investment surveillance to identify new uh, pathogens early? The savings came already, but now we are paying for it. Isn't the pay me now or pay me? Is this a pay me now or pay me later situation? So is this base scale effect of just saving money before? Um, it w yeah, I think it was. Um, and the answer is yes. So it's a great, uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think it's this idea that we. I don't know how we got to this point in healthcare where we have a supply chain that's that's totally focused on cost and not quality, and so not the quality of products. You know, um, the scariest book I've read in the last year is called Bottle of Lies about uh, the fraud at Rambaxi in the generic drug industry. Uh, but again, it was price and not quality. Uh, the supply chain is not responsible for quality um, uh, in the medications or in PPEs. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I think we're gonna, this is gonna be somewhere, somewhere we're gonna take a hard look. How do we prevent this from happening again? Um, and, uh, and, you know, we saved the nickel and mask or whatever we've saved from moving our production offshore. Uh, obviously, in retrospect, that looks kind of silly, but how do we prevent people from doing that to us again? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin, someone asked a good question here. Can you talk more about the economic impacts on student loans? So student loans, not just for MDs, but NPs and PAs and really anybody who needs them. Yeah, so I think um, I haven't looked at that extensively that we've suspended payment for some of the student loans, but obviously, again, what are what's going to happen on the other side of this? So what we find is that a huge chunk of the American public didn't have you know didn't have money to live through you know had five hundred dollars to live through some kind of uh, crisis like this, and so the safety net issues. Uh, the basic issues about, uh, mo again, that $80,000 I showed you at the beginning was the median household income. Half the households in the country uh, are less than, uh, have an income less than that. Um, and uh, that some of those have gone to zero. And so they're struggling uh, mightily with that. Great. Thank you very much. I see, uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit, Kevin, if you don't mind. Uh, Again, thank you to our panelists so much for answering all these questions. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Martin with us this week as well. And a question just came up. I think it's an important one. I wanted to highlight a little bit uh, the nursing home aspect of, of what we're dealing with here. And we're seeing it on the inpatient right now of patients coming in from the nursing home. Um, Dr. Verghese uh, had a really uh, nice article talking about the impending uh, concern that's happening right now in nursing homes. And Dr. Martin, thank you again for being with us. One question here, our former uh, Stanford president, Donald Kennedy, died from COVID-19 in a local assisted living. Uh, Dr. Martin pointed out how unprepared the environment is. Can Stanford help with a coordinated effort to help these local facilities? Yeah, it's um, been an interesting journey for me recently to try to learn how the public health system and emergency response work locally since the response to COVID in these facilities is basically run by the counties, um, including their emergency operations centers, which are separate from but related to the public health departments. 
and then the Public Health Department Communicable Disease Divisions. Um, and they are um, clearly somewhat overwhelmed. Um, the facility where Professor Kennedy lived and died is one where we have other patients as well. Um, and on Sunday of this last week, um, we heard from them that their usual 15 nurses per shift, they were down to three um, because so many people were out um, sick uh, with COVID or had stopped working or coming into work. Um, and so the facility was on the verge of evacuation, similar to some in the, that we've heard about in Southern California. Um, so the public health departments are trying to come up with a response um, and to help with things like staffing uh, once the facility becomes infected with PPE and with testing, but it's been very spotty. Um, so fortunately, uh, Dr. Mahoney has been helping a lot with, uh, with the testing uh, part of it to try and get everybody tested in these facilities. And so hopefully that's something that Stanford can help with because we do have a really great functional system for that. Um, and then I have started discussions with some of our leadership around help with PPE um, and obtaining PPE since many of these facilities, um, especially assisted livings are non-medical. They didn't have a lot set aside. They don't have the money reserved to pay for all this PPE either. So they're burning through thousands of dollars of it per day. Um, so that's a real challenge for these places if they can get it in the first place. Um, and then the, the harder one is the staffing part, and I'm not sure that's something that we can help with, but if anybody has creative ideas, I know that uh, they are pretty desperate for that. Um, nursing staffing and caregivers in particular, nursing assistants. So those are all areas where I would love to continue discussion on how we can help. It should be coordinated through the public health departments and the emergency operations centers uh, in the counties to be most effective, I believe. Great, thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, Dr. Weinecker, um, uh, is it possible to get serology testing done if you are a healthcare provider? Uh, yes, um, at Oc Health, we're doing all of the um, uh, staff and medical staff um, for uh, the testing. What they'll do is both the nasopharyngeal swab for um, RT-PCR for the virus, and they'll do the serology. You can't just go and get serology independent of the uh, nasopharyngeal swab. Um, we are doing it for asymptomatic patients, I'm sorry, uh, healthcare workers um, in Oc Health, um, in the emergency department, um, and symptomatic people at, over at Hoover. We're also doing um, asymptomatic um, people down at the Cancer Center South Bay, um, in Redwood City, um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm missing one or two places. Um, so you can get testing. We do need an appointment, and currently the way to get an appointment is to call um, Oc Health. Um, and as uh, Song answered a, a question earlier, they're working on a mechanism to make it easier um, to get an appointment, I suspect online um, or some other mechanism rather than just calling in. But for, for now, yes, you can do it, but you'll need an appointment. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Meineker. And uh, at that point, so guys, we're at nine o'clock now. Again, I want to thank everybody for uh, being with us today. We got through over 40 questions answered. Um, so panelists, thank you so much for being with us and being with us every week. Uh, Dr. Shulman, thank you again for a really wonderful talk. Uh, and we really appreciate your time. Hope everybody has a good rest of the week. And thank you very much. See you next week. Bye-bye.